Uh, welcome everyone to uh, Grand Rounds. This is a, certainly a unique um, uh, venue uh, for us to do this, but it's the, it's a very professorial here. You know, it's, you can imagine a patient right down here, and you're you're you're. you're I'd probably feel more comfortable with that having a patient down here. Yeah. But it, but it's really an honor to start this Grand Rounds, and this will be the the full hour uh, to have Pat Larusso, um, who doesn't need uh, any introduction to this crowd. Uh, certainly. Um, the director of our early uh, drug development group and uh, the premier uh, drug developer that, that I know uh, currently. And uh, she's going to talk to us a little bit about some of her work. Uh, she's the associate director of experimental therapeutics. And, and she's going to talk about NCI 10020, a laparib alone or in combination with a tenzalizumab in patients with HER2, BRCA, uh, mutated breast cancer. And it's going to be you know, translational at its very best from the bench to the bedside and back. So, Pat, thank you. So thank you all for coming. I've never given a talk where my entire audience is higher than I am. So this is, this is a first for me. Um, let me, uh, I didn't realize it was set up for right-handed people. I, I, I'm giving this talk for a couple reasons. So first of all, as part of the um, ACD team at the Cancer Center, Charlie's been making a push of, um, towards trying to integrate programs and trying to integrate the darts with the programs. And so I thought that this would be a good example of how we, on, it, on the experimental therapeutics team, um, which includes Mike Ciccini, Paul Ader, myself, Navid Hafez, uh, and none other than Joseph Kim, have been trying to really integrate that and how we've been essentially doing it, I think. Wouldn't you agree, Joseph, since uh, the last four years? And so I'm just going to show you a little bit about that. And I'm going to use 10020 which is a trial that I'm currently overseeing, which is a multi-institutional, national, North American trial, as an example of that. But also, the other reason is a little bit selfish. We're getting some really interesting results with NCI10020, and we're going to be getting in, into that in the next few minutes. And it's a real exciting drug combination that's extremely translational and I think has the potential to answer a lot of very important questions about DNA repair and immunotherapy because it's so heavily biomarker driven with multiple serial biopsies. And yet, all of the patients that have been recruited in the United States are outside of Yale. Yale has not found one BRCA mutant patient to put on this trial, and it's been open for over a year, not only on the early phase pro, uh, service, but also on the breast service. So I'm hoping that after today, we'll have a big enough pitch that maybe if any of you at the mothership um, are seeing a non-PARP-treated -BRAC, non BRCA mutant breast patient, or any of you in the community setting, in the care centers that happen to be listening to Grand Rounds today, see one of these patients, you'll consider this trial. I know it's heavily burdened for the patient, but I think we need to start answering these kind of questions if we're going to make a huge impact in the treatment of uh, BRCA mutant breast cancer with an emphasis on triple negative. But this study also recruits receptor positive patients, my disclosures. So just to give those that don't know um, a, a little bit of background, this trial is being funded off of a UM1 that I brought with me when I came to Yale. And it's Fortunately or unfortunately, up for recompetition. I'm in the active writing mode currently. It's due uh, in the NCI's hands on May 22nd. And this UM1, uh, there's actually 10 of them in North America. And basically what they do is they fund all of the sites that you see on this, on this map here. So this is an an, a North American grant. And we do get you know, recruitments from all over North America for all of our trials. And that's why the UM1 is considered a really good mechanism for multi-institutional uh, trials because it has so many sites. There's about, I think, 70 sites now total that are involved in the UM1 mechanism. So you can focus on rarer patient populations to be able to recruit to these, to these trials and uh, more difficult to treat uh, protocols as a result of this. And 100% of our trials are investigator initiated through the Early Therapeutics Clinical Trials Network, which only has phase one and phase two trials. But predominantly, a lot of phase two trials um, are run through this mechanism. So this is our little consortium 
Yale is the mothership for the consortium. We have five sites that we fund off of our UM1. Currently, we have UCSF, UCSD, Carmanos, uh, Vanderbilt, and Yale. Um, we chose Vanderbilt because of their funding mechanism through the NIH. This is a good mechanism to take concepts that are being funded off, that have been developed through R01s, SPORs, PO1s, and enter them into the clinic. It helps fund those clinical trials. And then you either get supplements or apply for R21s or R01s for the biomarkers. Um, UCSD we chose because of its Hispanic population UC and because it had phenomenal science, phenomenal science with an emphasis in hematology. And UCSF we chose not only for its population, but also because it was significantly funded, peer review funded, and we felt that we would get a lot of concepts through UCSF as well. However, <clears throat> we've been somewhat disappointed we're not going back in with UCSF. We will remain with UCSD. They've been a very good recruiting site for us. And what we decided to do was bring on board University of Oklahoma. So we're going in with University of Oklahoma because it'll be one of the few grants funded through the NCI that is a clinical grant that services a large Native American and rural American population. Um, University of Oklahoma is the number one recruiter to the LAPS grant or the NCTN mechanism, as well as to GOG. Uh, Dr. Manel, the cancer center director there, is one of the leads in GOG. But 20% of their recruits, 20 to 30%, depending on the year, are Native Americans. We feel that we can learn a lot, not only at Yale, but through our consortium, because they have a phenomenal navigation system that's funded through the federal government through supplemental funds in part on their CCSG and elsewhere to help navigate to bring in the rural Americans and the Native Americans to their site, uh, to, their, to their clinical trials. They also have a stellar biobank. And it, they're, they pretty much are uh, associated with the biobank right down the street. If you uh, look out their window, you can see it. And basically, it services the entire state of Oklahoma. And it brings in biospecimens from patients that are not only recruited to clinical trials, but are also diagnosed with cancer, not only at, Oak, at the University of Oklahoma, but throughout the entire state. And when I went there, I actually liked, I liked it. Tulsa's a pretty cool city, so anyway. But just to talk a little bit more about what we as a consortium, our five-site consortium, have done for the Early Therapeutics Clinical Trials Grant, what we have done is primarily non-solicited letters of intent. So what we mean by that is we come up with an idea on our own, not something that the NCI is soliciting to do, based primarily on science that's at our institutions. Um, Vanderbilt, as an example, had a couple concepts that came out of one of their spores. They're moving forward with uh, another concept from one of their head and neck spores, I believe it is. And we then write a letter of intent, a concept, that we then submit to the National Cancer Institute's Clinical um, Trials Evaluation Program in hopes that they will help support it. The, LO, the reason we use CTEP is because they have a huge pharmacopoeia of drugs. So it gives us access to drugs that we might not necessarily have access to, number one, but also most of what we do are drug combinations. And it's somewhat difficult to get two or three different drug companies to give us each independently a drug to do in our studies. But through the NCI, it's much easier to combine multiple different drugs from multiple different pharmaceutical companies. So this is just showing you where we have been for letters of intent. So I moved the grant here in 2014, and that's actually when the UM1 started. And as you can see, in total, we've submitted 35 letters of intent to the NCI based on concepts that we wanted to bring into the clinic. And if you see here, the majority of them are dark. They're, they're blue. They come from Yale. Most of the letters of intent that have come from our consortium have come from Yale University. But more importantly than that, and I think this is an important slide, of those letters, 35 letters of intent that we've submitted, 17 of them have been approved to advance forward into clinical trials. And if you look, the majority of the ones, there were 35 that were submitted, 17 that were approved, 13 that were approved from Yale. So Yale has about a 90% track record in getting concepts approved through the NCI. 
And as we'll be looking in the next several minutes, the reason why a couple of them were not approved was not because the NCI didn't like our concepts. So the average, because I'm writing the grant and I got these statistics yesterday, the average number of non-solicited LOIs that are approved is 14%. So we're about 90%, so we're well above we're well above the national average of letters of intent that are approved. And I believe it's because of the science and the teamwork that we bring on board. And I'm going to show you an example of that with NCI 10020. This is the first of two slides. Busy slide. I don't expect you to read it. But what I think it shows is that what we're focusing on with our letters of intent is promoting growth of junior faculty to make them develop into clinical researchers Joseph, Kim, and I have taken the road through this journey, I think, and uh, I'm very proud to say that the auditors that come from the NCI are extremely impressed now with Joseph, Kim, and they even indicated to me that they feel that he's one of the most solid clinical investigators that they have throughout the entire network. Not that I had anything to do with it, but I'm proud that he's had three protocols and three LOIs. Joseph, keep up the good work. But what we do is we try to mentor through this mechanism. So the senior investigators typically do not submit the LOIs. And that's also extremely different from the national average. We're about 98% junior faculty driven. The average is about 12 to 15% junior faculty driven. So we're really trying to educate our junior faculty and teach them how to do clinical research understand translational research, and work with basic scientists to move concepts forward. I point out these two because, as you saw, Yale got 13 of the 17 LOIs that were approved. And two of the LOIs that we got that were disapproved were not disapproved because they didn't like our concepts. They were initially approved by the NCI, but unfortunately AstraZeneca could not give us their We1 inhibitor to move that comp concept forward. And by the way, they decided to develop that concept in-house. And then um, the second one was a trial from Amr Zayden, and we could not get the atezolizumab through Genentech because I believe that they were moving that concept in-house as well. So sometimes our concepts are great, and they're so good that companies want to move them internally um, so that they can actually control the data and move it through at a much faster pace. And this is our accrual, and I think our accrual is really good. So last year, we put on about 108 patients on the UM1 trials. And when I talked to the NCI last year, last year the, N the entire network, all 70 plus sites, put on 700 patients. So we're, we're second probably, I think Dana-Farber may have put on a couple more patients than we did. But we're actually doing quite well. And as you can see, for the for the most part, Yale has been instrumental in recruiting most of those patients to these trials. Could also be because we have a vested interest, because most of the ideas that have been driven from our consortium have come out of Yale University. So now I'm going to focus the rest of my talk on NCI 10020, which is the, the protocol number for the clinical trial. And it all started with a solicitation application. So Shortly after I got here, the NCI was looking for concepts for atizolizumab, um, which was um, one of the immune checkpoint inhibitors from Genentech. And I'd always wanted to look at an immune checkpoint inhibitor in combination with, with a PARP inhibitor because I really felt back then, even before we really had a lot of in-depth science, that DNA, DNA repair was going to be pivotal and was going to be an important component in terms of response and possibly even potentiation or synergy in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors. So at that time, I had a young, young junior faculty by the name of um, Joe McLaughlin. He was an instructor at the time. And Mario, who's one of the world's best immunologists. I mean, we're very lucky to have Mario here as a medical oncologist whose focus is immunology. Kurt Schelper, who was a young and coming star, this was before the translational research lab or the TIL lab was developed. I believe he was still under Dr. Rim's direction at that time in his lab. Joanne Sweezy, who I had met and I knew was interested in DNA repair. And then Yu Shear, who was the biostatistician 
that was the, the, the umbrella biostatistician for our UM1, because the UM1 had transferred from another institution. So I think we met maybe six or eight times. We met for an hour to an hour and a half each. And we came up with an idea of bringing a PARP inhibitor in combination with an immune checkpoint inhibitor. We talked about how we were going to schedule the drugs, how were we going to develop the initial component of the trial so that we could assure safety of the drugs, what translational biomarkers we were going to need, how many biopsies we would need in order to be able to really truly answer what are the effects of a PARP inhibitor on the immune microenvironment and the tumor, it's, uh, and the tumor, and does this have any impact on an immune checkpoint inhibitor's uh, benefit in these patients? And also, finally, does do the two drugs in combination impact positively or negatively? And can we identify whether or not there are biomarkers of response or resistance with this two drug combination? We went in with Viliparib because that was the only PARP inhibitor at the time that the end, well, actually, we went in with the Biomarin compound, um, which is now owned by, I think, I don't know who it's owned by now, I think Pfizer. But that compound was purchased by the drug company shortly after we submitted this. Um, the company pulled the drug out of the portfolio. They had Viliparib or ABT888 at the time, and that was the only PARP inhibitor that the NCI had. And I didn't know how I could manipulate to get a Laparib, so we went with Viliparib because that's what the NCI told us we had to do. The questions we were trying to ask when we submitted that LOI was, what is the spectrum of the immune microenvironment in these BRCA mutant tumors? Nobody really understood the true profile at that time. Do these tumors, do these BRCA mutant breast tumors have a unique environment, immune, mic immune microenvironment, relative to non-BRCA mutant tumors? What is the mutational burden of these BRCA mutant tumors? Do PARP inhibitors increase the tumor mutational burden and possible neoan and potential neoantigens? And as a result, could they impact positively on the treatment response? What changes do occur to the immune infiltrate after we give a PARP inhibitor? And does the combination of a PARP inhibitor and an anti pd one inhibitor improve the overall response rate and duration of response over either PARP alone or the immune checkpoint inhibitor alone? Our hypotheses were three, that PARP inhibitor in patients with triple negative disease and HDR deficiencies will increase the mutational load and neoantigen abundance and presentation, that PARP inhibition will increase the immune infiltrates and T cell activation in the tumor by increasing the mutational load or neoantigens, and then finally that the immune checkpoint inhibitor will be upregulated, or PDL1, the target, will be upregulated in response to the immune infiltrates and Th1 interferon gamma signals caused by the PARP inhibitor, thereby increasing tumor neoepitopes and then potentially increasing the response rate, or at least maybe potentially increasing the duration of response of the two drugs in combination. So we went in with a little bit of background. First of all, triple negative breast cancer, and we have subsequently changed it because the patient population was challenging. And to begin to get more patients, we're just taking BRCA mutants, triple negative, or receptor positive patients with the amendment. But ironically, most all the patients that have been recruited are triple negative. We knew at the time that triple negative breast cancer accounted for about 20, 25% of all breast cancer, about 20%, that it was a poorly differentiated tumor. And at the time that we brought this concept forward, there were really no standard therapy in the metastatic setting for triple negative breast cancer. I don't think that's changed too much. But what we also knew was that if you looked at all breast cancer patients, and you looked at, um, you sub, sub segmental or, or subtyped them into, re oops, sorry about that. Um, how do I, just a sec, I'm going the wrong way. It's a very sensitive, I don't think I'm, yeah, right here. And you looked at the subtypes, you looked at ER positive, HER2 positive, and triple negative. What you identified was that there was an increased number of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in both the stroma as well as in the tumor relative to the, in triple negative disease, relative to the other subtypes of breast cancer. When we knew that TILs were increased, 
But the question was, what type of T cells are these? And this was one of the things we felt that was important to know if we were going to better understand what we were doing with this drug combination. Kurt's lab had shown that triple negative disease or triple negative breast cancer had increased lymphocyte infiltration. And if you look here, this is breast cancer with low tills. And as you can see here, this is breast cancer with significantly high tills. It had an increase in pan T cell marker CD3, but also of the cytotoxic, C, uh, T, um, cytotoxic T cells CD8. So what you saw here relative to hormone receptor positive disease with both CD3 as well as the cytotoxic T cells CD8 using QIF, uh, statistically significant, those p-values are huge, there was a greater amount of both CD3 and CD8 cells in uh, triple negative breast cancer. We also had data from Loy's manuscript from JCO that showed that tumor infiltrating lymphocytes were actually prognostic in patients with triple negative breast cancer. So if you look down here in, the, in, the, um, in this patient population, in terms of overall survival, those, those patients whose breast tumors had lymphocyte predominant breast cancer had an overall survival advantage over those patients who, tumors uh, over those patients whose tumors did not have lymphocyte predominant breast cancer and it was a predictive biomarker essentially of survival and Wimberly et al and David Rim's lab had shown around the same time or shortly around the time that we were putting this together that there was an association with PD1 expression um, it was associated with tri both triple negative breast cancer and an elevation in tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Using three independent antibodies in two separate cohorts of patient tumor samples, they were able to demonstrate a statistically significant in uh, increase in PDL1 expression in those triple negative breast cancer samples that had elevated uh, levels of TILs. And then finally, again, in that paper, she also showed that both PD-1, uh, PD-L1 protein as well as RNA were higher in those tumors that had lymphocyte predominant, in, in, in those tumors that were lymphocyte predominant versus those that were not lymphocyte predominant. As you can see here, looking at um, both the, the tumor itself uh, using um, aqua as well as the stromal, uh, the stromal population of cells. And Kurt with uh, Lajos Pustai went on to show that in those triple negative breast cancer samples, BRCA deficiency was, ex was a real positive marker of those patients that were going to have an increase in neoantigen load and an increase in inflammation. And they actually did this by using various RNA signatures. And as a result, basically what this showed is of those triple negative tumors and patients that had triple negative disease, those that had BRCA mutant tumors, the environment had an, demonstrated an increased adaptive immune response over the triple negatives that were non-BRCA mutants. Around that time, we started getting some of the preliminary early phase data from the atezolizumab uh, story. And what it showed, and this is just looking at breast cancer, uh, patients that were put that were treated with the TISO in the early phase study, there was an unconfirmed response rate in monotherapy of about 24%, with three partial responses and two complete responses, with a duration that was up to about 42 or so weeks, and the progression-free survival at 24 weeks in these patients was about 33%. So there were several patients, there were some patients that responded. Unfortunately, there were a lot of patients that didn't respond. And there were no biopsies taken, and we didn't really know exactly what these tumors looked like or whether or not any of these tumors had anything that would be a potential predictive biomarker of monotherapy response. Concomitant with that information around the same time, or uh, shortly before that, there was an, a preliminary phase two trial that was published in Lancet a few years before we put this through. And it showed that Olaparib demonstrated an improved benefit in patients that had BRCA mutant breast cancer. This was a preliminary phase two trial. It looked at two different doses. The higher dose obviously had a better progression-free survival than the lower dose. But even with this, the overall response 
was not earth shattering and exciting, but it was better than anything we had for these patients. And so while we were submitting our protocol, the phase three trial was moving forward, looking at a lapra versus standard of care in this BRCA mutant patient population. So we submitted the proposal and it was looking at filiparib and atezolizumab. We started with Joe McLaughlin and unfortunately he moved on and I inherited the I inherited the protocol, so we actually moved it forward. And it was something that I'd always been interested in. I've been interested in breast cancer ever since I started uh, oncology and uh, spent a lot of time developing cancer uh, drugs that move for have moved forward to the FDA in this arena. So we initially started with a three-arm trial. We wanted to know what did the monotherapy PARP inhibitor do, what did the monotherapy pdl one uh, inhibitor do, and what did the combination do? And the only way we could look at this was to initially treat with monotherapy and two arms in a combination, and then subsequently any of these patients in the monotherapy arm at progression could be crossed over. Before we treated these patients, they, were, uh, they had a baseline biopsy. Subsequent to that, they were randomized. We didn't randomize them first because we were worried about fallout. We treated them. At six weeks, we did another biopsy. And then if they progressed, they could go on to crossover. If they didn't progress, they maintained. And if they were on the combination, they maintained. And then we continued them on until progression. And at progression, we did another biopsy, thereby allowing us to understand the various components in terms of biologic benefit that hopefully would predict for therapeutic benefit in the future. But at the same time, we really didn't know what filiparib did or the PARP inhibitors. And there wasn't a lot of data in the literature. And so this is where Joanne Sweezy came in. So we were developmental therapeutics or the experimental therapeutics program. Joanne Sweezy was the radiobiology and radiation therapy program. Kurt Schelper was the immunology program. So we brought three different programs together with the DART, the, the phase one DART, to move this forward into the, into the clinic. But we had to go back to the bench because we wanted to understand what was it that these PARP inhibitors really did. And that's where Joanne came in. It was unknown what PARP inhibitors did to neoantigen load. That was a question we wanted to ask. It was unknown what they did immunologically to the microenvironment in the tumor. It was unknown what the biologic benefits of the combination would be. And if at all there would be a therapeutic benefit, uh, benefit of the combination, could we determine why? So she went back into the bench, and the first thing we had to do is figure out where we could cell lines to study this. Well, there aren't a lot of complementary BRCA mutant, BRCA wild type cell lines. So she got HCC 1937, and what, which is a BRCA mutant cell line, and what she had to do was complement it so that there was an assimilation of a BRCA wild type versus a BRCA mutant cell line. And as you can see, her lab did a really good job of complementing this cell line to make it BRCA complemented, or? I think it's actually Junji Chen's lab. Okay, well, somebody's lab did this, thank God. So then what she wanted to do was try to, you know, separate out these cells so that she could try to understand exactly what was going on. So she took the bulk tumor, I might be saying this wrong, so thank God she's in the audience. She single cell cloned these cells. She then treated these single cell clones for three weeks with filiparib, went back, it, and single cl cell clone them again. And then after she single cell cloned them, she took each of these independent clones and looked at DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, looked at mutational load, mutational signatures, and neoantigen prediction. So BRCA complemented, BRCA, uh, BRCA mutant cell lines. What she identified here in this, in, in this experiment was that filiparib could induce mutations actually in the BRCA complemented cells. If you look at the BRCA mutant, they already have a significant mutational load. Giving them filiparib really didn't change it that much. The BRCA complemented had a much lower mutational load at baseline. Exposing them to filiparib increased that mutational load, um, increased that mutational load somewhat, but still not nearly as high as the mutational load of the inherent BRCA mutant cell line. She then also looked at various signatures within, um, with, within these cell lines. So this is the BRCA complemented cell line. And as you can sell, see, it has a significant presentation of molecular signature 5. 
Not that much molecular signature 3 as you would expect relative to the BRCA mutant cell line, which had no molecular signature 5, but was predominantly molecular signature 3. Then what she did is she exposed both of these cell lines to viliparib and developed a new molecular signature, 12, in these cell lines. Um, but that molecular signature 3 in the BRCA mutant cell lines was pretty persistent despite being treated with the PARP inhibitor. Um, and as you can see here, the main changes were in the development of a new molecular signature that was induced by the PARP inhibitor, viliparib. She then went on to look at whether or not there were any, cha any inflammatory or immunologic changes. And what she identified was that there was upregulation of both interferon alpha and interferon gamma in the BRCA-complemented viliparib-treated cell lines, which was interesting, indicating uh, an inflammatory response. But she also saw it at least as well in the BRCA mutant cell lines. She saw upregulation of both interferon gamma and interferon alpha, both in the complemented as well as in the BRCA mutant cell lines. But what she also saw was upregulation of pathways that were specific to the BRCA1 mutation, that were specific to the, um, the uh, BRCA mutant cell lines. She saw a hallmark inflammatory response. She also saw um, a, a enrichment of IL-6 JAK STAT3 signaling, which demonstrates a poor clinic, or which uh, alludes to a poor clinical response, which we see in these patients if we don't treat them with PARP inhibitors, and she's seeing this in the BRCA mutant cell lines. And she also saw a TNF alpha signaling response, which is indicative of T cell suppression. And she also saw greater upregulation of these inflammatory pathways in the BRCA mutant cells. So these are the BRCA complemented cells or the BRCA wild type. And you do see with viliparib, you see some upregulation of the inflammatory pathways. But if you take the BRCA mutant cells, you see significant increase in the three inflammatory pathways, CCL5, IRF, IRF1, as well as CD74. And what also was very interesting, because CGAS sting was becoming very important at the time, she looked to determine whether or not she could see a differential in CGAS sting and whether or not it was upregulated with viliparib. So in this experiment, what she did is she had exposed these cells to viliparib for a few weeks, I think at least, and then she removed the viliparib from the cell culture, from the medium. She noticed as soon as she removed it, there was an upregulation in um, you know, CGAS sting uh, in the BRCA complemented cell lines, but it really didn't change after 24 hours of being void of the viliparib exposure. But in the mutant cell lines, what she saw is when she removed the viliparib after three weeks of exposure, there was an upregulation. But after 24 hours, the CGAS sting res response really escalated in this in vitro um, cell line experiment demonstrating that the, this was significantly greater upregulation in the mutant cell lines relative to in the uh, complemented or wild type cell lines. Finally, she looked at expression of chemoattractants or cytokines. So basically what she did, uh, she exposed these, um, these lines to PBMCs in a conditioned medium. And then what she did is she looked at um, the PBMC count in the in the amount of cytokines or chemoattractants. And she really didn't see much of anything, cytokine increase in the BRCA complemented cell lines. But what she did see is significant increase in cytokine expression um, in those uh, BRCA mutant cell lines that were exposed to viliparib. And this just showed that um, this PARP trapping also seemed to correlate with the induction of both cytokines as well as T cell migration. And as you can see here, this was statistically significant for the majority of the cytokines that she, um, that she investigated. Well, around that time, we were, you know, she was doing all these beautiful experiments, and we had this viliparib three-arm study that wasn't doing much in terms of recruitment nationally. There were some patients that were going on, but if we were gonna, and at that time we needed like 130 patients because of the three-arm study. 
And if we were going to wait to complete the trial with filipparab, we were probably all going to be dead, or at least I was going to be, by the time it got completed. And I really wanted to see what the results were. And the reason we weren't recruiting is because of the elaparib uh, PARP inhibitor. The elaparib data had been presented, and it had come out. And we knew as a fact that elaparib was probably at that time, and probably still is, the primary PARP inhibitor, the most relevant PARP inhibitor, in the treatment of these women with germline BRCA mutation, in these men and women that have germline BRCA mutations and breast cancer. And so we not only, you know, this data showed that there was an increase in progression-free survival. Not huge, but there was an increase. But the thing that there wasn't was there was no overall survival advantage. So what we said was, let's go back to the table. Let's, this is very common with clinical research. We need to go back and figure out how can we make this trial such that it'll be attractive to patients, attractive to their caregivers who have to put them on the trial, because it's a challenging trial requiring three biopsies. And at the same time, you know, we can get the information that we need. And we said we got a great response here in terms of progression-free survival, but the overall survival in this patient population left a lot to be, you know, left a lot of room for improvement. And so we also, around the time, had the Mediola data, which was the combination of Olaparib in combination with Dervalumab. And what you saw here was that the duration of response was nine months with the combination versus six months for monotherapy Olaparib, as was defined in the Olympiad trial. And the progression-free survival, as you can see, was about um, eight months versus seven months. Again, the combination was better than monotherapy, but we still needed to understand why. Although biopsies were optional in the Mediola trial, we have AstraZeneca with us here today, I don't think they got too many biopsies, serial biopsies in those patients. So it's great to be first to the finish line in terms of recruiting your patients, but if the data is equivocal or just somewhat better, and you've got all these all-comer patients that you haven't defined what they really mean, it's much more important to understand the tumor at this point than just the germline mutation. You need to go and look at the tumor because that's going to really help you identify. So we went back to the NCI. This was a high-priority trial. By then, by the time this happened, the NCI had already given Kurt about $1.5 million to do his biomarker, so we needed to get tissue. And we went back and we redefined the trial. Number one, do we need all those patients? Number two, we knew that the monotherapy data for PDL1 was not earth shattering, and we were worried that patients were not going to be wanting to go on the study because of that monotherapy at TISO. We also knew at the time that Viliparib data had been read out and it was equivalent, not superior to standard of care, and we knew we had to get rid of the Viliparib. So, what we did is we changed the trial to monotherapy Olaparib versus the combination of Olaparib and Atizo keeping the baseline biopsy, the biopsy at six weeks, and the biopsy at progression. Our primary objective was to determine whether or not we could get a progression-free survival difference in these patients between a lap of monotherapy and the combination. And we did allow, because it wasn't survival, it was just progression-free survival, we allowed the patients with monotherapy again to cross over to the combination at progression a lot of secondary objectives, and that's where the tissue comes in. We wanted to compare the progression-free survival to any immune response that we had seen. We wanted to compare the time to treatment failure based on immune resist, as well as normal resist, as well as look at overall survival and duration of response based on response rate by both immune resist and regular. Determine the changes in the extent of the mutational burden in these tumors at baseline and progression, Evaluate and characterize the changes in the extent of PDL1 expression and tumor immune infiltrates, and retrospectively evaluate tumors with limited immune infiltrate, which were non inflamed, to determine if PARP inhibitors could increase that immune infiltration, and then finally to determine the immune related best overall response of the combination. And then we had our exploratory objectives. Obviously, you need to sequence to look at neoantigen differences. So we were evaluating changes in candidate neoantigen profiles in immune inflammation signatures using DNA and RNA sequencing, evaluating and characterizing circulating tumor DNA and immune parameters. By now, we've, we've enlisted Avi Patel to help us. 
um, test the hypothesis that DNA repair status affects tumor immune interaction, characterize the mechanism of action of the PARP inhibitor elaparib, and explore the inclusion of patient reported outcomes. Um, because that's becoming a big thing, and the FDA is starting to require that as we're moving forward in the FDA, FDA approval of new drugs. So this is essentially what our wish list of biomarkers looked like. Um, we were also initially collecting frozen tissue, but what we ran into was that sites like Hopkins couldn't snap freeze their tissue, and so that was limiting recruitment. So we moved everything over into FFPE. And we essentially had, um, we were looking at both tumor tissue as well as peripheral blood and PBMCs. And we were, as you can see here, looking at PDL1 by IHC, TILS by both H&E and QIF, uh, quantitative immunofluorescence, DNA mutations by whole exome sequencing, so we could look for mutational signature and neoantigens, antigens, and then RNA expression by RNA-seq, looking at transcript signature, again, in neoantigen uh, expression. We prioritize these as the top five wish lists because when you have tumor tissue, you may not always have tumor in those cores, so we had to do a prioritization list. First and foremost, PDL1 by IHC, TILS by H&E, TILS by QIF, whole exome sequencing, RNA sequencing, and if we had extra tumor PARP, TCR clonality, we were just pulling blood for circulating tumor DNA, and then if we had any extra tissue, CYTOF, because Kurt at this time was developing a CYTOF um, directed DNA, um, DNA panel, and we wanted to see what that looked like. And potentially, if there was any tumor left off, left over, we were going to ask the NCI, the Frederick Lab, if they would do a comparative analysis between Kurt's Cytoff DNA repair panel and their multiplex DNA repair panel, where they looked at PHOSPHO-NBS, RAD51, and Gamma-H2AX. And as you can see here, this, I think, is extremely important. And the reason is because in 2014, the TIL Working Group defined how they were going to evaluate tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in breast cancer. It was by H&E. We knew that H&E was probably not the best way to do it. However, the International Working Group had already defined how they were defining TILs. And so in order to do a comparative between what we were identifying and what was out there, we felt that at minimum we had to do the same type of evaluation that the International Working Group was doing. And so we, this is just looking at the initial part of the trial where we did viliparib only. And that's what I'm going to focus on today in terms of the biomarkers. But what it showed was that, yes, we could collect serial biopsies on our, on our patients. So those patients that went on trial had a minimum of two serial biopsies. Some of them, as you can see, had three serial biopsies. What Kurt is doing is he's doing image digitalization and analysis with every core that we get before we start doing biomarkers, Kurt, bless his heart, looks at the quality of the biopsy. He looks for the presence and proportion of tumor cells, the presence and proportion of non-tumor cells, infiltration of stromal tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, the presence and percentage of necrosis, and any additional comments that he feels he can do. And we are successfully doing this on every core that he gets. So let's just look at the TIL scoring by H&E of the first several patients that were treated on the viliparib arm. What we see by H&E is that in several of these pairs, either two, two pairs or three pairs, in some of these patients we are seeing an increase in tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And it's primarily being seen after the PARP monotherapy or the PARP combination biopsy is assessed. And as you can see here, though, he's also looking at it with more than H&E because H&E can't tell us what type of cells and what the architectural pattern of the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are. So he's looking at that um, with quantitative immunofluorescence. So this is looking at this TILS by multiplexed QIF. And what he is showing here, it is demonstrating a significant change in the T-cell infiltration across multiple samples and T-cell subsets. So it isn't a huge data set because this is only the first component of the trial where we were using viliparib, 
But what it does show you is, number one, yes, we can work together as a team. So programs, you can work together. Yes, you can, you can bring ideas into the clinic. That's what we did here, and it's working. We can get serial samples. You can use the ETCTN to help you do your trials because they focus on biomarker-driven investigator-initiated trials. And we can handle the tissue and get meaningful results. So finally, I just want to show you, um, these are a couple, these are the, some of the samples that um, we took in the initial three-arm study where we looked at baseline biopsies and tumor at six weeks. So one thing that he looked at was individual T cell receptors or clone count. And as you can see here, he showed, for the most part, with filiparib and with the combination, an increase in the alpha, gamma, beta, and delta components of the T cell receptors. What's very interesting is this patient right here, because when I show you the clinical data, although it's minimal, and remember, this is just, you know, this is just suggestion. We don't have a big enough data set. This patient is actually quite interesting. He also showed that there was a change in T cell sequencing or clonotype count. Again, demonstrating that, yes, we can do this on the samples. And actually, these are precious samples because they're serial biopsies over time. They're not archival. We know we have the annotation down 100%. We know what the BRCA mutation is. We know what the neoantigen load changes are, the DNA. And we have circulating tumor DNA to move this through to be able to map CT DNA with tumor DNA and um, all the RNA signatures that we need. And he also showed that there's a, max, uh, there's, um, a maximum CDR3 length that it's increasing. So it's showing that it looks like, at least, that we're putting pressure on T cells that are more likely to recognize the antigenic tumor peptides. So this was that first group of patients that we treated. This is some of the response data. And this is the patient that had that high T cell receptor load and T cell, the, uh, the clonal sequencing and the clonality. And this patient progressed on Viliparib, never responded, and went on. And this is a P, uh, PR, almost CR. This patient went on to have a really nice durable response when we added a tezolizumab to the combination. And this is the study that's ongoing right now. We actually just put the 24th patient on. We need 68 patients to make a difference. And I urge you to send your patients to us instead of just treating them with off-label, off-study off Olaparib, although it's FDA approved, we're never gonna learn if we just treat and see response. Because what we're trying to do is understand mechanisms of response and resistance. But what we're seeing with the combinations is we're seeing some nice responses, and these are durable responses. And a couple of these patients have come off opioids and are doing really, really well. Finally, we, you know, that all was great, but why are some of these patients progressing? And are there, is there anything that we can look at within the tumor, especially the post-progression, the progression biopsy, to help us? And so Ryan Jensen and Megan King have been working closely with us to look and see whether or not they can help us figure out PARP inhibitory resistance mechanisms in the BRCA setting. So the goals of this component are to identify more patients who may benefit from PARP inhibitory therapy due to HDR deficiency, and to rigorously test if reversion alleles in that BRCA uh, underlie PARP inhibitory resistance and the functions um, that play a role. And then finally, to broadly understand resistance mechanisms so that we can rationally design combination therapies in the future. And not only give patients with BRCA mutations, as an example, a lapra, but maybe better understand which should be getting a pdl one inhibitor as well. But maybe we need to personalize that combination further based on what type of resistance mechanisms or maybe baseline biomarkers that we see with those patients. So their first question that they want to answer is, how does BRCA status at the time of treatment affect response? And we're doing that by looking at genomic sequencing to determine the allele status and the frequency. And then secondly, we want to know whether or not BRCA reversion alleles are responsible for PARP inhibitory resistance and tumor relapse. Ryan has some beautiful cell-based and biochemical functional assays. And these novel and or anticipated functions taken on by BRCA reversion alleles 
appear to be driving tumor progression, but he wants to understand that more. And so he's really looking at the BRCA reversions to see whether or not those truly um, equate with um, drug resistance. However, <clears throat> 68 patients is probably not going to help you understand that because not all patients end up with reversions. And so we've been very, very fortunate to team up with AstraZeneca. They're giving us all of their Solo2 data, um, although, albeit it is, it is an ovarian cancer, and they didn't do tumor biopsies, but they did do serial circulating tumor DNA on these patients, and several of them have reversions. And basically, I think this data set that AstraZeneca has given us is the biggest single-handed data set with reversions that we know of to date. Um, and so we're pretty excited to work with them. Ryan and Megan have already started working with them on, these, on, the, on this program with the essential questions. Do these putative reversion alleles reconstitute BRCA function? Are they responsible for PARP inhibitor resistance in patient relapse? And finally, are these reversions neomorphic tumor drivers? I think the outstanding scientific question that we're all asking is, what is the molecular basis for PARP inhibitor-mediated synthetic lethal killing in BRCA-deficient tumors? And how does, or how does BRCA1 and 2 and other HDR pathway uh, changes successfully deal with PARP inhibitors? I think for future, there's difficult clinical questions that need to be answered. We need predictive biomarkers for HDR and PARP inhibitor patient stratification. It's not good enough to just give everybody the same drug. Can we suppress the, inhibitor, the PARP inhibitor resistance mechanisms? What will be the optimal combination therapy for PARP inhibitors? And will it be different depending on what that initial tumor looks like? And will these combinations, as I said, need to be personalized? Thank you very much.